In Christ's name, amen. Amen. Just a quick note on the, the, this uh, service that we're doing today. It's a special service. We've been doing this each week of the worship series. Um, we're doing most of our worship at the end, and today we're also doing communion at the end. So I'm going to try, and an emphasis on the word try, to make this message just a little bit shorter than normal. You can say amen to that. That's all right. Um, we're going to try and make this shorter so that we got plenty of time to celebrate communion as families today. It's going to be it's going to be different and it's going to be fun. Uh, just a little bit of a review. Last week, Pastor Ricky preached. So was that not amazing? Um, yeah, he, he gave you two different Hebrew words. Um, I'm going to try and pronounce them, Tehillah and Zamar. And what they were all about is they were about the power of music. Songs of praise and, and songs that are played with instruments and the fact that God has chosen music to have power. He designed it that way. And that might sound odd for some of us, but maybe we just think sometimes we get a little bit emotionally moved with music. But Pastor Ricky dro dove into the idea that God has actually ordained, sound like a beeper was going off there. Sorry about that. Um, God ordained music. God has ordained many things um, as, as vehicles or as pathways to spiritual power. Sometimes people will ask, why do I have to pray for a thing in order for God to move? And often my answer is, I don't know, number one. But number two is, because God chose prayer. And because God chose prayer, we walk in prayer. Amen? And God chose music and decided to put power in music. And he gave us, uh, Pastor Ricky took us to three different passages last week, and we looked at King Saul, who had chaos in his life. Anybody got chaos in your life? And God used the power of music to bring peace into King Saul's chaos. Love that. There was a moment when uh, 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 an army and they were stuck in the desert and they had no water. And everything was desert and dryness in their life. Have you ever had desert and dryness in your life? God used the power of music to bring about a miracle that brought water to those people. And then there was a time when King Jehoshaphat and all of Israel was surrounded by the Moabite army, and they were absolutely trapped with no way out. Have you ever been trapped with no way out in your life? And God used musicians, and he took them to the front of the assault instead of an army. He took musicians there because he decided to break the power of the enemy through the power of music. Just cool stuff. Cool stuff. So today's word, and we're going to say it together, is toda. It's like toda. Not tada, like, you know, a magician might do. Toda. Say toda. One, two, three. Toda. Toda is simply to, me, to, to say thank you in the ancient Hebrew. Thanksgiving or to thank. If you were going to walk up to somebody in ancient Israel and just say thank you, you would say toda. It was just that simple. So I've got some verses for you. Three Psalms. Look at these. Psalm 56, verse 12. The very first one. I will fulfill my vows to you, O God, and I will offer a todah of thanks. Todah for your help. That was two todahs, Pastor. Yes, it was. In the Hebrew, it just says todah, todah. It was a sacrifice of thanks or an offering of thanks. And we're going to get into those offerings in a minute. Psalm 69, 30. Then I will praise God's name with singing and I will honor him with thanksgiving or todah. I'm going to honor God by saying thank you to him. The first one was, I'm thanking God because he helped me. And then the third one, Psalm 107, let them offer sacrifices of thanksgiving, todah, and sing joyfully about his glorious acts. I'm saying thank you to God, but not just because I should. I'm saying thank you to God because he's done things in my life. Amen? We talked the first week about there needs to be a why in your worship. And sometimes we got to be reminded of what the why is behind our worship. Because if we remember the why, we may find ourselves worshiping just a little bit more and just a little bit more passionately. Now that, ta-da. Part of the reason it's important is because it wasn't just saying thank you in the Old Testament. You saw that phrasing, sacrifice of thanks, or offering of thanks. 
What's that all about? It was actually a ritual sacrifice the Israelites did as part of the Old Testament law. They would actually bring a special offering or sacrifice to God, and it was called the offering of thanks. Now, ritual sacrifices are kind of weird for us in our culture today, right? Like, we don't do these ritual sacrifices anymore in the Christian church. And so why in the world would we talk about them? Because Jesus Christ died for mankind once for all. Amen? And when he died once for all, we don't have to go back and do the Old Testament sacrifices anymore. And that's awesome. But it's still valuable to go back and look and to learn and to see what it was that God was trying to say behind that old structure. And so we're going to look at that old structure for a few minutes here. Hold up the number five, everybody. Everybody, hold up the number five. Good compliance, 100%. Five offerings in the Old Testament. And we're going to walk through all five of these. Because, again, you're going to see this incredible picture of the Christian life and the approach to God through these five sacrifices. First one is the burnt offering. So the burnt offering was devotion to God. It was, it, was, it was me saying, I belong to God. My life belongs to God. Next one was the sin offering. It was the payment for sin. So I did something wrong, and I acknowledge through a sacrifice, something has to pay for what I did wrong. Again, that might sound odd to us, especially when they killed an animal and blood was shed in order to do that sin offering. The, now, the reason for it is because what I'm acknowledging there is, God, what I have done is so grievous, I should be removed from humanity. God, what I've done is so grievous, I've brought darkness into your perfect world. I've brought pain to your other children who you love. And so there should be a consequence, and the consequence should be my life. But I don't want to give up my life for the thing that I did. Amen? We don't want to give up our life for the thing that we did. So in the Old Testament, an animal had to lose its life so that I didn't have to. And again, that was a, that was a picture of what Jesus was going to be. The next was the guilt offering, because not only do I have to pay for my, my, my personal guilt for what I've done, but there's also compensation that sometimes needs to go to people and to God, because my sin was so grievous that people need to be compensated, amends need to be made, and that was the heart behind that offering. So the first three there, if I had to put them all under an umbrella, it's me saying, God, I'm sorry. God, I'm sorry. If the first three are God, I'm sorry, the last two are God, thank you. And the first one here is the grain offering. That's me giving my first fruits to God and saying, God, I belong to you now. And I'm going to show that I belong to you by giving you my best. And then the next one is the thank offering, and it's gratitude and love. And we're going to walk into that fifth one, that thank offering, and how important that is. I'm going to break it down for you. But I wanted you to see the big picture. Why? Because you don't get to the thank offering until you've gone through the sin offerings. Because the thank offering means God and I are good now. And we're restored now. And Jesus did all of that. Amen? So we're going to do thank offerings. So how how'd the thank offering work? So an Israelite would come up to the priest at the altar and they would bring valuable things like, like an animal. And, and, and that would be part of it. Think, think grilling good meat. Amen? Amen. Okay, it's, it's going to be an animal. And then, then sometimes they would also bring unleavened cakes, um, which, which that's like, um, uh, like a wafer or a cracker. Like, like there's no yeast in that. And that's okay, right? But often throughout the sacrificial system, it would all be unleavened bread. In this particular one, the thank offering, they could also bring leavened bread. And sometimes they would bring it with oil. And sometimes they would even fry that bread. Where are my donut people this morning? Right, like that's good stuff. And so they would bring that to God. And the idea was, I'm going to bring all these gifts and all this exuberance to God. It's going to be a great time. And here's the second thing about it. In the law, this thing was optional. So much in the Old Testament law is required. And we just, when we think about God's Old Testament law, we think it's all required, right? Like if I don't do that, God's going to burn me down to a cinder or something. But this one's optional. And that might sound weird to you, but 
But think about it. It's like if my sin is forgiven, it's now up to me. Do I want to bring thank offerings to God? I get to opt into that. I may not, or I may choose to. And, and as soon as you start to do that, again, some of us might feel a little bit nervous about that, but doesn't it start to tweak your motive a little bit when you start to bring that thank offering to God? It's like, I brought this today because I want it. I brought this today because I'm so thankful. I've chosen to bring this to my Father in heaven. That's the idea. The third piece about it is this is for God, sure, but who else is it for? It's also for the priest and it's for you. So again, here's the picture. Most of the sacrifices in that system, they were, they were burned on the altar, and most of it rose like, like some kind of an aroma to God in heaven was the picture, and it was all for him. Sometimes a bit of the sacrifice was given to the priest, it's, uh, the priest themselves, and it was part of their compensation, part of their livelihood. But this one's special. This one's different. And what they would do is they would take everything that you brought up to them, and they would burn just a bit of it on the altar, and the smoke would rise. And the idea is that part was going to God. But then the priest would also eat some. And for the thank offering, most of it was supposed to be left over. And then you were supposed to have a party. You were supposed to sit down with your family. It, this is all in Leviticus 7. And then you, if you go into Deuteronomy 12, it starts to alter the picture a little bit. Not only just your family, but also the poor in your city. You would sit down and you would have a potluck if you were a Baptist, amen? You would have a potluck. You would have a banquet. You would have a feast. You would sit down and, 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 and there's just something about sitting down with people and celebrating all that God has done. But it's not sitting there and feeling guilty. Ooh, some of us define that's what church is, is sitting down and feeling guilty with God. Amen? That's not what this was. This was sitting down and experiencing the joy of a restored relationship with God. Because I'd already moved through all the sin and guilt offerings with him. And now I got to sit and I got to celebrate with my people. And the fact that part of it got burned up to God was also the idea that he was there amongst us and with us. This offering was not just called the thank offering. It was also called the peace offering and also called the fellowship offering in the Old Testament or the fellowship meal. So when David is saying, make your thank offerings to God, he's calling you to a banquet. It tweaks us a little bit. You get to eat with God. What kind of people do you eat with? Like, you eat with people you like. Right? Like, you eat with people you're okay with at least. Like, there's a lot of people you know in this life, right? Like, like your relationship has a certain measure of depth. People at church, people from school, people from your neighborhood, from work. And like, like they're all different. But when you bring somebody into your home and they actually see your kitchen and dining room, Aren't you at a different level with those people now? Right? Like, you just feel it. Like, everything changes. And what you're doing is you're inviting depth. You're inviting closeness when you say, let's eat together. And if people are broken with you, it's hard to have a meal with those people, isn't it? So God inviting us to a fellowship meal, there are things underneath all of that, that he's communicating. Not only are you forgiven, but today in this place, I'm inviting you in, and I want to be around you. I want to be with you, and I want to communicate to you that we're good and going deeper. That's what a thank offering is. Isn't that a nicer picture? I think it's a nicer picture than sometimes what we bring to God in our praise. Sometimes, sometimes we'll, we'll bring God empty words, and I get it, and I'm there, and I'm human. But, but what David has called us to, to bring this sacrifice, uh, sacrifice or offering of thanks, he's calling us to a much richer picture. And I think we need to see it today. Um, there was a time we were raising our kids. I, f I forget which, which of our kids this was. Um, they'll probably tell me later, but, but I, I truly don't remember. But we had this thing where... 
at night when we were eating our meal together around the family table, we required everybody clean their plate, especially of the vegetables. Where are the parents at? Especially of the vegetables, right? Because here's the pattern that we saw. And you might think that we're way too hardcore, and maybe we were. I don't know. But the pattern that we saw is they wouldn't eat all the food, right? Especially not the vegetables. And then they would wake up the next morning and they would go for the, the sugar-filled cereal and it was like eight, nine, ten bowls while they gorged themselves on this terrible food. And we're like, we got to do something better. So we, we required them to clear the plate. And if they didn't, they got no snack that night. And, and we were, we were so structured about it. And there was one night and we were taking the, the kids to Dairy Queen and there were green beans. God help us, there were green beans. <laughs> and one of them, one of my precious three, could not consume the green beans. And, and so we, we went, and, and this Dairy Queen was like three blocks from our house, so we would walk to it. And we're going to the Dairy Queen, and, and they just, you know, they're kind of walking kind of sad because they know. They know we're all going to Dairy Queen, and I'm not getting ice cream. You know what I mean? And it's this brutal thing. And it's like, and we went, we, I mean, we went through the whole thing, and like, there's this picnic table that we would sit at, and we walked up to the counter to get our stuff, and they just walked right over to the picnic table and just sat down. And they were very accepting. So good for them, right? They're very accepting of it. And we go through the whole deal, and Linda and I have just this quick moment, and we're like, you know what? This is all well and good, and the structure is right. We feel good about this. But we also want to teach our crew what grace is. And so there was a moment, and it just presented itself to us, and I think it was the Holy Spirit kind of came in and said, hey, how about tonight you do something different, and you make it really clear to this kid that they're going to get grace tonight. And so we went to them, and we just said, hey, how about you go back up to the counter? We're going to buy you some ice cream. And they look with shock, and it's like, I know you don't deserve it, and we know what happened here, right? But we're going to give you what you don't deserve. Just like a pastor, right? Make a theological point out of Dairy Queen. <laughs> They're all going to be in a psychiatrist's office for years. Um, anyway. <laughs> But here's the thing. They went and they got an ice cream cone and then they sat down with us. And do you know how much power was in the sitting down with us as they sat there with an ice cream cone on the same level as the rest? And as they sat there and they licked that ice cream cone, do you know what every lick represented? <laughs> that I'm good and that we're good. I'm not broken and we're not broken. And I'm included. I'm restored. Right? Right? Isn't that what that means? This is what God has invited you to. See, he's not just invited you to guilt. He has not just invited you to a place where you theologically understand that, that somebody named Jesus died for your sins, but you really still ought to do some penance, and you still really ought to do so, so, some guilt feelings. God's called you to a meal where you get to walk in your forgiveness. You get to walk in freedom and restoration, and you need to know with every single bite who you are now with him because you're good. Let me give you a minute for that to sink in. And jump into the New Testament. And Jesus and the disciples sit down for a meal, do they not? And it's the Last Supper, some of you theologians are like, yeah, but that was Passover too. And it's like, I know it was Passover too. But how powerful was it to some of them to know that they were sitting down with the high priest of our faith and eating with him? And how powerful for them was it to know that they were sitting down with God himself and eating with him? And what did that say about their relationship with him? And you're like, there was Judas, and I know there was Judas. And then when we die and we go to heaven or we're raptured into heaven, but as soon as we're in heaven, do you know what happens when we're first in heaven? A party. Revelation calls it the marriage supper of the Lamb. And every single person who is under Christ, every tribe, nation, tongue, people, they're all gathered together at one big long table. It must run on for miles. And we eat together with Jesus. I don't think that picture's an accident. 
I think we're sitting down with God, and I think we're restored. And I think with every single bite that we take, it affirms to us, I am no longer guilty. I'm no longer doing penance. I'm no longer that person who did those things. I'm fully restored with God. Somebody say amen right there. Amen. I might get excited. Communion. We take the bread, we take the juice. Do we not? And Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. It was meant to be an ordinance, a new ritual, if you will. But no one dies again. Instead, we sit down with who? With God. And we take the elements and we remember what's been done for us in thankfulness, in restoration, in peace, in joy. It's all of that. We've been taught guilt so much. Look at Colossians Chapter 1, verse 21. And this verse right here will change your life. You were God's enemies. You were separated from him by your evil thoughts and actions. And yet now he has reconciled you to himself through the death of Christ in his physical body. And as a result, he has brought you into his presence. And that's present tense. Right now, he has done that. And you are holy and blameless as you stand before him without a single fault. Say that back to me, without a single fault. Without a single fault. fault. That's scripture. It's mind-blowing. You know what we expect that verse to be? We expect it to be, someday you'll be without a single fault. If you keep going down this path, If you keep trying hard enough, right, you keep seeking God, you keep keep feeling bad for what you've done, and and you you know what we're talking about, right? We're not just talking about the little things. We're talking about your top three sins of your life because you know what they are. You can write them down right now. So could I. Those things? No, no, no. You're holy and blameless. Why? Because of the cross of Jesus Christ. It's not because God woke up someday. Now, hear me on this. It's not because God woke up someday and decided sin was no big deal. No. That's, that's the world, okay? That's our culture, okay? Look, our culture wants to diminish the value of our actions. And it wants to say, no big deal. And nobody's actually hurt. That's a lie from the pit. The reason this is true is not because our sins are small. It's because Jesus is big. It's because what Jesus did on the cross was enough. It was 100% enough. And theologians, man, they, they struggle with this idea. They struggle with the idea of how could Jesus take on a cross and every single man, woman, and child for all time, every generation, past, present, future, every single one of them, all their sins, all piled up. How could he take on a cross and pay for all of it? And theolog- theologians don't know. Like, did God have a rate? You know, like every second he hung on the cross, this many sins got covered? Like, we don't know. We don't know how it worked. But he did it. The lift takes my breath away. But he did it. And this verse tells us he did it. And so when that thief on the cross turned to him and said, remember me when you come into your kingdom, did that thief on the cross have time to do penance for his sins? No. Was he less forgiven than you and me? No. You here today, if you are in Christ Jesus and you've given your heart to him, then Jesus came in and he did all the other sacrifices for you. And you are forgiven and your shame and your guilt is done. Done. Period. 100% over all of it. All of it. And you're like, yeah, but I I, I binged again this last week. It's forgiven. It's done. Like grace should so blow you away that it changes your life. That's what's supposed to change your life. Not coming to church enough. It doesn't change a human soul. Your guilt doesn't change your human soul. It's not enough. Only Jesus is enough. Only the the miracle of grace is enough to change you and to change me. And and the fact 
the fact that it says you're holy and blameless today, you're not a shameful person. You're not a shameful person. We're going to come back to that at communion. So I, I spoke with a person this last week, and we got to talking about this worship series that we've been in. And man, I've enjoyed this series so much, by the way. Um, it's been so great to look at um, all these words in the Hebrew and what praise means and all the different facets of it. And if you've been following us on this, you've seen that I've been really pushing on you guys. I've been pushing on you guys, and, and I've been challenging you in these services to go further in your worship. So we've done a lot of talking about bowing before God and hand raising and singing loud, and we've talked about all of those things. And in the conversation I got in with this precious person in our church, they had felt judged in that. They had felt pushed so hard, like I was pushing them so hard, that I didn't want them to be who they were. And they were more reserved. And when they read a verse like, be still and know that I am God, that was their verse. And they thought I was unhappy with them, or that maybe they weren't welcome in this church. So can I just say this individual who I talk with They were incredibly respectful. They knew exactly how to talk to somebody like me. They did an amazing job, A plus, 100%. But because they did such a good job, I'm like, I have to repent. I have to go before God. Because guys, there are moments, there are defining moments in a church and, and for a pastor. When you've got to remember, it's like, oh, wait, I'm not Jesus. He is. Oh, wait. I'm just an under-shepherd. He's the actual shepherd. And so when I get up here and I talk to you guys, I'm doing my best, but I'm a man. And I'm a sinner. And sometimes in trying to get you guys to move, sometimes I'll go too far, get too harsh. And I think I did that a bit here. So I publicly apologize for a service, and I'm apologizing again. If you felt like that person did, uh, I, that's part of the reason I'm bringing it into the service because if anybody else felt that same way, I want you to hear loud and clear from me, that's not what I believe. I don't believe that you shouldn't be part of this church. I don't believe you should feel, feel judged by that. Second thing I want you to know is I don't think it's about the outward appearance at all. I think it's about the heart. Amen. So go to this verse. This is Isaiah 29, 13. It says, these people come near to me with their mouth and they honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship of me is based on merely human rules that they have been taught. What's God saying there? He's saying, listen, there's something about a religion where everything's on the outside and the way that we act so that other people give us a pat on the back. He's like, but if the heart is not engaged, if there's no fire there, that's what God cares about. And so... Just to be abundantly clear, you could be as still as a statue and your heart be on fire for God. And if you are bringing him an offering of thanks and praise in that quiet place, praise God for you. And I don't want to judge you. I don't want to be harsh with you. That wasn't the point. I'll also say, You could be as charismatic as they come. Hands could be up. You could be dancing in the aisle and distracted and thinking about something else. And it could be dead in here. It's all about heart. That's what he wants. So the hand raising, the the bowing, all of it, in my mind, those are tools that are God trying to get you to a heart place. But those aren't the important things in and of themselves. Are we good on that? If you get anything for this entire service we've done on worship, it's that God wants your heart more than anything else. Would you guys stand right now? So we're going to do a few songs and we're going to do communion. 
But I would encourage you in these songs right now. Could you get yourself to a place where you're not just going to sing along, but what you're going to do is you're going to offer in your heart an offering of thanks to God. And come to the table and celebrate with him in joy the miracle that you were at peace. And when you think about what you're praising him for, the why behind your worship, it's because you've been forgiven of all things. Amen? Amen. Let me pray. Lord God, we just thank you, God, for this time. We thank you for this moment, God, that we're about to have together. Lord, I pray that you would come in, Lord, and I pray that there would be thank offerings all across this room and online, God. Bless it, Lord. We love you, God. In Christ's name, amen. We're going to do our communion this morning. We're going to do it a little bit differently. Um, we're actually going to set these things up at the front of the stage. I just want to say to everybody who's online right now as part of this stream, um, first off, we love you and welcome to church. Um, we see you guys each week. Um, see you, Terry T., Chuck and Ruth. See you, Marjorie. Um, see you, Beetle family. Um, see you... Uh, um, Roger, um, just so many that are joining us every single week. Love you guys. Um, if you don't have communion elements, just hit pause right now. Go get yourself a cracker and some water, whatever you've got in the house, and we would love for you guys to be a part of this. <clears throat> um, these are a little bit different this week. Um, we got a brand new kind that are meant to be more user-friendly, amen? Amen. That's super important. So the juice is on one side and the, the, the wafer is on the other. I remember when Linda and I first got married 25 years ago. And when we first got married and we left the church, we were legally married. But I felt like a faker. I didn't feel like it was real. I didn't feel like a husband. And then I remember when we had our very first kid, Jake, tiny little baby in the hospital. And they, they actually let us leave with him. They trusted us enough. It was crazy. But I remember walking out the door. We didn't feel like we were parents. We felt like fakers. I remember being a pastor and marrying that first couple officiating their wedding for the first time and signing their marriage license. It's like, are they just going to laugh at City Hall when they see this thing? Because I don't feel like a pastor yet. I feel like a fake. Isn't it weird how our feelings take quite a bit of time to catch up to reality? So we're talking about the cross today. And we're talking about the fact that you're forgiven and that there's no guilt and that there's no shame over you. There's no penance to be done that Jesus paid for it all. And while we're sitting there talking about all that, a lot of you internally are like, yeah, but I don't feel it, Pastor. You got to ignore those feelings. You got to ignore those. I get it. And we all feel them. Let's get really, really direct and practical. Some of you guys, you had sex outside of marriage. Can I just tell you, Jesus Christ died for that and paid for it 100%. And that you are clean before him. If you've given your heart to Jesus Christ, you've given your life to him, you're a new creation in Christ. Behold, the old is gone and the new has come. And you're forgiven. And God's not waiting around for you to do just a little bit more before he forgives that one sin. And some of you guys cheated. You committed adultery. That's forgiven too. In Jesus' name. It's under the cross, 100%. Some of you guys got wrapped up in pornography. It's forgiven. Like, but he even stumbled this week, Pastor. It's forgiven. Past tense. You are not shameful before him. Jesus Christ's cross is enough. Amen. Amen? You can take these today and know that you're clean. The jail time that you did, you're not a second-class citizen in the church. You're forgiven 100%. And God loves you. You're shame-free today in Him. Some of you struggle with rage and, and temper and anger and bitterness. And 
and you've said things to your kids and to your spouse and you deeply regret it and you've, you've given wounds before and that's what you're carrying today and you're forgiven 100% under the cross of Jesus Christ. It's enough for that. You've betrayed that friend. The cross of Jesus Christ is enough for that. Some of you spent years, even decades, away from God and away from church. You grew up and you knew the truth and then you walked away from it and you're back here now. And you wonder whether or not you're a second-class citizen in heaven. No. You're forgiven 100%. It's under the cross. So when you take this, it's a thank offering. And it's a fellowship meal. And you get to sit down with God. And you get to say, thank you. That's all I got to say. Thank you that I've got no guilt today, God. Thank you I've got no shame today, God. I'm not going to sit here during the communion moment and try to think about my sin and replay the tapes. Stop replaying the tapes, people of God. Stop it. Amen. Just thank him. Right? Some of us were taught that's like, we've got to think about the cross and how brutal and gory it was and replay the passion you know, movie in, in our heads. No, you don't. Don't do that. Don't think about the agony. Think about what he purchased for you. The fact that I'm clean and I'm restored. Amen? So I'm going to pray, and we're going to keep playing, but they're playing over you, okay? It's not for you to sing along with. What we want you to do is we want you to come out of your seats and come up and get some communion elements. And some of you might want to come and get enough for your family and take it back to your family. And maybe take it together as a family in your time. Have somebody pray. And just, those are the prayers. Thank you, God. Amen? Jesus, we thank you for this right now. We thank you, Lord, that your, your sacrifice was enough today for us. We're not going to wait around. We're not going to do penance, Lord. We're not going to try, God. Amazing grace. Thank you, Jesus. In Christ's name, amen.